love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Today's reading is Acts 1, verses 1 to 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave, leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, he asked them, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set from, by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be with my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After this he said, after he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up at the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood before them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking at the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way. You have seen him go into heaven. Waiting, the action of staying where one is or delaying action until a particular time or event. I prefer this definition, waiting, a complete waste of time or a time of preparation. A complete waste of time or a time of preparation. It all depends on how you see it. Have a look at this. What do you see? The pipe. Have a look at this. That's a painting of a very fa famous painting by a guy by the name of René Magritte in the 1920s. The words below are, this is not a pipe. When he was asked uh, why he put that up, he said this, the famous pipe, how people reproached me for it, and yet could you stuff my pipe with tobacco? No, it's just a representation. 
So if I had written on my picture, this is a pipe, I would have been lying. It all depends on how you see it. Our reading this morning depicts very clearly how the disciples saw the situation they were faced with. They, over the last three years, they've experienced a complete overhaul of their understanding of who the Messiah, the Saviour of Israel is. They've seen miracles, they've been part of some of the miracles, and one of them had even walked on water. Then they had lived in three days of complete terror as they watched Jesus arrested, tried, crucified and resurrected. And I don't know which would have been the most frightening, his crucifixion or his resurrection. After his resurrection, they met with him, talked with him, they had breakfast with him, and one had even placed his hand in the sword-pierced side of Jesus. And then, when they met together with him, not just once, when you look at that reading, it says, when they met with him, not once or twice. This was the burning question. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, Jesus, like he seems to do with me quite often, when I ask a question, he doesn't answer that question. He answers another question. And I believe that the question that he answered in that reading was, what are we going to do now? We've been together with you for 40 days. What are you going to do now? What are we going to do? Well, Jesus was going back to heaven. But they didn't realise that they were to be a vital part of providing the bridge between Jesus' ministry on earth and his ministry within the people that he was talking to and to his disciples, that they were to be the bridge between it. But first of all, they had to wait. They were told twice, once by Jesus and then by his henchmen, the angels. Stand beside the men and said, what are you doing here? Get back to Jerusalem and wait. And there is another burning question that I have when I read this. Why did they have to wait? I mean, Jesus has come back to life. He's been around for 40 days. The Apostle Paul says that there was at least 500 people that saw him at one time on one day. So if he could do all this... Why didn't he just speak out, snap his finger, and all that he wanted to happen, happen? Why did the disciples have to go back to Jerusalem and wait for another 10 days? Well, they have to go back and wait. Not as a useless waste of time, but a time of preparation. A time to prepare themselves for what they needed that would make the mission that God had now for them to happen. They are to wait for what they need, what they need more than anything else. To be all that Jesus had called them to be and to do all that Jesus was calling them to do, they are to wait in Jerusalem for the very presence of God to come and live within them, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they had to wait because Jesus knew that in 10 days' time, a match would be struck in pa Palestine that would eventually ignite the whole world. In 10 days' time, there was going to be a match, a spark, and it would ignite the whole world. Little did the disciples know that they would be the people who would carry the flame from this match in Jerusalem and to the world beyond. 
they needed to wait. Now, that word wait does not mean to be inactive. doesn't mean to have a useless waste of time. It means to prepare yourself, get ready. And the waiting is important to get our heads around. It's not a complete waste of time for us either, the waiting. 41 days from now, we're going to be celebrating this event, what we call Pentecost. What are we going to do now? How are we going to apply ourselves? Are we going to sit around in a useless waste of time or are we going to talk with God, open ourselves up to him a bit more than what we have been doing so that we can be prepared for the work that God has us to do at this time? The interesting thing for me when I read this story and read the book of Acts is that when the disciples asked Jesus, is now the time for you to come and stitch up the Romans and free Israel? They believed in Jesus. They believed he could do it. But they needed to go a step, step further. They needed to believe him. Not only believe in him, but actually believe him. So that when he told them to do something, they would do it believing that no matter how weird and crazy it was, that it would happen. They had to change their mind, and it all depended on how they saw it. We know, when you read the book of Acts, that Peter was totally changed. A few days earlier before this event, when Jesus was being arrested, he ran and hid, he went out to see what was going on and denied Jesus three times. And then when he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he's a different guy. He goes out. He stands out with, in front of everyone. And he explains to them what's happening, what's going on, so that the people could see it the way they needed to see it and understand it properly. Not only did he believe in Jesus... He believed him that when he stood up and spoke that people would not crucify him but would respond to him and come to know Jesus for who he really is. The rest of them were changed. They built a community. They went out and spoke about others. A couple of them going to worship God saw a guy sitting out the front and he asked them for some money and he says... I haven't got any money, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great if next week on our way we saw a couple of people around in wheelchairs or something like that, and God said to us, go and tell them the same things Peter and John did. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. To do that, we would have to be people who not only believe in Jesus, but who really believe him that when he speaks to us that we'll do some of the weirdest things people have ever seen, but it'll work. They were drastically changed and we need to be changed as well every moment of every day. Most of us can look back on a time before we knew Jesus and we look at ourselves now, we know we're drastically changed and the people who knew us before did. To show you how much Jesus, uh, Peter was changed, one day he's up on the roof praying and all of a sudden there's something like a sheet comes down and it's filled with all sorts of animals, birds, the lot. And he hears a voice say to him, kill them, cook them and eat them. And he says, no way. I've never done this before. I've never eaten anything that the Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. I can't do that. And the vision appears three times and then goes. Now downstairs, there's three guys who have come from a Roman officer to tell him there's something going on in my house. Will you please come and explain it? 
And Peter goes, and these Romans, these people who are not Israeli people, they're not Jewish people, they're what we call Gentiles. And while he's there, the Spirit of God comes upon them. Just as it did in that upper room. And Peter, all of a sudden, sees something differently. And he starts to believe now that not only the Jewish people, the people of Israel have this God, the Gentiles can have him too. And that's why we can come here today. And when you read the book of Acts, those guys and those ladies, we forget about the ladies, there are a whole bunch of ladies as well who went with Jesus. They went out and they believed that what Jesus told them to do, that they could do it and it would happen. Now, what about us? We are facing some very, very difficult times. There's going to be the best part of a thousand people lose their jobs who work for the government. As a result of that, there's going to be a lot of other people lose their jobs. If you're anything like me, you know, that every time you go to the supermarket, <laughs> the bill gets a bit higher than it was. Uh, I looked on the old property I used to live in to see what the new rates they were thinking about, talking about, and they're gone from $1,800 in 2018 to 4500 this year to 5500 next year and 6500 the year after. How are the people going to withstand that? How are we going to, what are we going to do about it? We've got a food bank out there. Already we cannot supply the food that's needed. Can you imagine what's going to happen as we move on? A few weeks' time we've got a budget and it's all going to start taking place. What are we going to do? Well, I was thinking about this and then I read about my old friend Elisha. I, I love Elisha. He's such a cool guy. I mean, he, he does real weird things. But he's walking on the road one day, and he sees this woman. And she's got two children with her, and she calls out to him, Elijah, help me. My husband's died. He's left us in debt, and the guy who we owe the money to is coming. He's going to take my two sons away, and he's going to use them as slaves in payment of the debt. Elijah keeps walking and he says, um, what have you got back home? And he says, I've got a little bit of oil. He says, go back home, go down the street you're in, get all the jars and all the bowls that you can get, take them back home, close the door and pour the oil into them. And she does. And jar after jar, bowl after bowl is filled. And when she's filled all the jars and all the bowls, the oil stops. When the guy turns up to the debt, she uses the oil to pay him. And what's more, there's heaps left over to live on. Now, two things have to happen. Elijah and her had to believe in the God of Israel. And they had to believe the God of Israel. I mean, can you imagine standing in front of the person at the supermarket and you've got a trolley full of stuff and their purse is half full and you say to them, go and get a bit more. And when they turn up at the supermarket counter to pay, there's more than enough money in their purse. Do you have the courage? Do I have the courage? Do we have the courage to be people who go out and see others and believe to, enough to ask God, to listen to him, to hear him, and to do what he tells you, no matter how weird it seems?
I'm going to ask you to do something weird. But I want you to listen before you do it so that you can make an educated decision. What I'm going to do is ask you to, all of you who can, to stand up. No, not that. Not that. Listen, <laughs> you, don't, you don't know what, what, what's coming. I want you to think about some ministry you're involved in, some people you know who need God's help. And then I want you to pray out loud, not shout, just in your normal voice, for 30 seconds, asking God to reveal to you something you can do so that your ministry will grow stronger or that person you're thinking about will be helped. And we do it all together. Those of you who can't stand up, you can do the same thing sitting down. And if you don't want to, that's okay too. Right, stand up. I'll tell you when the 30 seconds up, let's go. Father, I want to thank you that uh, I'm involved with the uh, Recovery Church. Thank you for all the people. Thank you for my whole life being a reserve for you and my faith. Thank you for my family helping to so that I can do what I do and be healed. Thank you. How hard was it? Why don't we turn up 9.30 every Sunday morning instead of half a dozen in the back room? Why don't we all come here at 9.30 and pray, asking God what he wants to do, what he wants us to do? Sit down. The interesting part about this story is that it's not only the disciples who are waiting, God is waiting. This year, I uh, decided that I would uh, study Lent and I would keep the Lent thing and I decided that I would uh, get some material that should help me and I found some stuff written by a guy, by the, a German pastor, theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Now, Bonhoeffer lived in the early part of the 20th century, a German uh, when Hitler came to power and was raised, he spoke out against them. To help the rest of the world understand what was happening, he went on a, a worldwide preaching tour and told them what was going on in Germany and how they had to stand against what was going on. At the end of the time when he's in England and come to the end of his preaching uh, series, a group of people who have come to love him say, you can't go back to Germany. If you go back, Hitler will kill you. And he says these words. He said this. If the church of Jesus Christ in Germany did not stand with the German people in their time of trial, it would forsake the right to stand with them and the rebuild after Hitler's regime come to an end. Folks, we're in a difficult time. If we do not determine to stand with the people of this city in their difficulties, when we come out the other side, we'll forfeit the right to talk with them as well. So let's make that decision. Let's wait. Let's take these next 41 days, just individually and as a group of people, to believe in God, to believe him, and to do what he asks us to do. Now, to get involved with this, the first thing you need to do is believe in Jesus. And if you are sitting here today and you have never consciously made the decision to follow Jesus, you have just gone along with him and come here just to... Today would be a really great day to say, I'm fed up with just going along with what's happening. And I'm going today to become a follower of Jesus. 
I'm going to believe in him. And then be prepared to take the next step. Maybe you believe in Jesus. Maybe you need to have the courage and strength now to believe him. That he will do everything that he tells you to do. And empower you to do it. And you will see the results of it. We're going to sing a song now called I Believe in Jesus. And as we sing it, if you want some help to make the decision to be a follower of Jesus, if you need, know you need some help to be someone who really believes in him, then just come on, sit down here at the front and someone will help you.